Welcome to the With You webinars by Westwood Community Church. We're so glad that you joined us. Our hope for all of this is that um, we can meet maybe a felt need that you're experiencing. Uh, tonight we're talking about job loss and that transition that comes with that. And then tomorrow we talk about parenting through COVID-19. And then um, on Thursday, we are doing a little segment called Ask the Pastor. Um, and we're going to talk about how we find God through uh, COVID-19. But today we have a very special guest, uh, Scott Swain. He is on our board. He is an HR expert. I've had the privilege of knowing Scott over the last few years, um, getting to know him better. Um, but Scott, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself, maybe a little bit about your, about your background in HR and um, why we have you on today. Okay, great. Thank you, Kevin. This is a great topic, I think, to kick off the webinar series with. So I appreciate having a chance to talk to this. So um, yeah, we, um, I started coming to Westwood with my family in 2005. We just moved to the Twin Cities from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I married my childhood sweetheart, Paige, and we have four kids that range from 13 to 26. I know you mentioned this already, but I'm uh, thankful to have a chance to serve on Westwood's leadership board and have been the leadership board chair uh, most recently. And um, my background uh, is in human resources, and I've spent my entire 30-year career doing what I believe is my life's work. And uh, the, the last 20 years, I've been at General Mills, and I recently left General Mills uh, as their head of recruiting. And prior to that, I was the HR director on their two foundational businesses, their cereal business for all the Cheerios fans out there. And then I also sat on the 10 person leadership team for the yogurt business for anybody that loves Yoplait. Mm. Um, prior to that, I worked in the robotics industry as the head of HR for a couple of years for a company in Davenport, Iowa. And then uh, I started my career in the pharmaceutical industry with Abbott Labs in Chicago and San Francisco. Mm. And one of the things that's keeping me busy right now is in January, I opened up uh, my own LLC. So I'm the principal of a HR and a leadership advisory firm called Billy Goat Consulting. That's awesome. Well, we're, we're honored to have you on. You have a wealth of experience. I want to give people a little lay of the land as they navigate this interface called Zoom. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see uh, an opportunity. It says Q&A. Um, our hope for this is that it can be somewhat of a dialogue so that we're not just talking at you, but you can ask questions um, and, and bring up ideas that you have that uh, maybe questions around a certain the topic that Scott is covering at the given time or something you'd like for us to kind of circle back to at the end. Uh, feel free free to submit your questions there. I can see all of those. I'll kind of uh, host us as we navigate this and uh, jump into it. But I think uh, our hope is that we can bring some relevant topics to you as you kind of navigate uh, maybe a season where you've lost a job. Maybe you know someone who has, or you're just kind of curious about if it does happen, how can I prepare myself or what can I begin to do now? And so, Scott, I, I thought a great place for us to start is this simply like, the response um, when we hear, when someone hears that they lose their job, when, um, when, when you uh, initially get that, that call into the office, there, there are so much that comes with it. Um, what, how would you encourage someone? What would the first thing you would encourage them be to do? What would they do when they first hear that maybe they lost a job or maybe they know somebody who did? Yeah. Well, I, I think this is a great place to start because there's a lot of emotion in this and, you know, whether you're that person that's hearing that news or whether you're supporting somebody that's your spouse or a friend or neighbor that has recently heard that or uh, is maybe anxious that they could be hearing that in the future. Um, I do think that there's a grieving process that comes along with that. And, uh, I think it's important to just acknowledge that right away because, you know, here they're faced with um, a change and that change is going to pull them away from their work friends, maybe team that they're used to in terms of a job they've had for a while and they're facing uncertainty and um, you know, not knowing exactly where that's going to go and so one of the first things I would just say is uh, to really encourage people to maintain their confidence mm -hmm. this whole thing. I, I've worked with so many people that um, when they hear that news it feels like such a judgment that's been placed on them by somebody else and and maybe uh, it feels very personal and almost a commentary in terms of not just their work, but who they are. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's one of the most important things that we can do as we help others through it um, is uh, to help focus on rebuilding that confidence and reminding them um, what makes them unique, what makes them special. Um, 
we heard this at the leadership gathering not too long ago at Westwood, this idea of having a personal board of directors and mm-hmm. really encourage people to, to assemble something like that with you know, those people that know us best. Um, they've, they've been with us. They've seen us at our best times. They've seen us when we've gone through other challenges in life. And um, those are the type of people that can really uniquely and very authentically encourage us. And they also can give us some really good feedback and some really honest feedback that we can trust. And surrounding yourself with people like that, I think is really important to kind of build that confidence and help us work through the, the emotions that are associated with receiving news like that. Yeah, and one of the things is we were preparing, um, you and I, we talked about this, but we, we both have a unique experience. We both have been let go from a job and I was three months into getting married and um, my position got dissolved at the company that I was at. And we went through this, this process, it, it was almost like a, you shared a little bit about it, but I began to think back on all of the things over the last month or year or like leg, length of time that I had been with that employer. And I began to evaluate all of those things. What did I do? Was there something I said? Was there something that, that I didn't do? And I think that that is normal and healthy. And you've talked to me about the, the three typical stages that, that someone goes through when they lose a job. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to, Kevin. And, and as you said, we have that in common and that, you know, that uh, this situation I faced in, in my career as well. Um, actually, when I left the you know, robotics company that I was talking about before I joined General Mills, it was um, a situation where our business you know, wasn't doing well. And I ultimately had to lead a corporate restructure that let the co-founder of the business go and let 20% of the workforce go. And the next day I had to fire myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, you know, it's a, just, it's just a very challenging situation um, that comes with that. But I do find that uh, people tend to fall into one of three uh, categories and it's kind of on a continuum. Um, you have uh, some, some individuals that when they receive that news, um, that emotion turns into um, a process where they look back and they're, they're not willing to accept that news and maybe they begin to be very critical of the decision that's made in the organization. And, um, their emotion and their energy is more towards looking back at the situation that's just happened to them. Mm-hmm. There's another category of folks that um, are almost just frozen in, in, in their place. They, they don't know what to do. They've maybe never experienced something like this. The, they feel the responsibility and the burden that comes with that. And they're not necessarily looking back, but they're also not, not really ready to start looking forward yet. And they, they really need somebody sometimes to help them to move forward. And, and some organizations will even provide an outplacement counselor or something like that that they could also supplement that personal board of directors. Mm-hmm. But then the best case scenario, whether you start there or whether you ultimately get there is this place that is forward looking. Um, it's really, it doesn't necessarily mean you agree with the decision that was made, um, but you're willing to accept that and to move forward and to be solution oriented and to start thinking about the possibilities uh, and the opportunity. I remember when, when that happened uh, for me at that robotics company, as you can imagine, a lot of people would say things like, oh, Scott, I'm so sorry to hear that. And how can I help and support you? And, and you know, that, those were very kind words that were shared. And at the same point, there were some people that actually said, congratulations, I couldn't be happier for you. You're a free agent. You know, mm. this, this is a chance for you to do something that you never maybe would have done otherwise. We can't wait to see how this turns out for you. Mm. You're going to be such a blessing for another organization. I can't wait to hear you know, what, what comes next. And so how we respond to people in those situations can also maybe help them to move through that continuum as we go. And uh, if you're somebody that's in that situation, you can also um, look to uh, gain strength from some of the spiritual disciplines that, that we have around us. It may be a good time to you know, start a new devotion or something that, that provides some new routine that is faith focused, that gives us a rock to hold on to during the uncertainty of the, uh, of the waters that are coming before us. Yeah, and, and the pastor and me can't move past this point of, of, of encouraging you, like, hey, if, if you're in a season where you, you've in, you're in transition, I would encourage you, don't, don't feel like you have to rush through those stages as you experience them. Allow God to work in the midst of that 
um, like Scott shared about, find that board of directors, find that community that can speak into you, help build up your confidence. Because what we know to be true is that God works in the midst of all of that, as hard and difficult as it is. And what it allows us is to look back and see God's faithfulness. And so if we can be present in those moments, experience God and all that he has for us, man, there's no end to what we can see God do through it. So I just, as the pastor, I have to encourage you to, to not rush through those stages, but allow God to work in the middle of them um, and lean on him in that season. So Scott, somebody gets through to the stage where they're ready to move forward. They've kind of, maybe they've grieved, or maybe they've kind of done what they need to do. Um, what, what would you say is a great first step when they're ready to kind of start their search? What would you advise somebody in that place to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking of two things right now, Kevin. And the first one uh, is something that isn't typically done um, because many times when we hear that news, we want to jump right into action. And so it's not unusual to immediately update our resume or to immediately go out to the job posting sites and look for opportunity and begin to apply for those. And I really would encourage people to take a moment to step back before they jump right into that action and um, really define what it is that they are looking for. Because if we don't know what we're looking for, how will we know when we find it? Mm. And it, it takes me back to um, a junior achievement when I was in elementary school. If anyone remembers that first grade curriculum, it talked about the difference between a want and a need. And in today's terminology, maybe that is essential versus non-essential. But it's really picking those three, four, maybe five things that are really priorities for you in the job search process. And then being comfortable identifying those things that maybe would be nice to have, but are not a gotta have. Mm. So I'm going to try to you know, bring this alive with some storytelling as we go tonight, Kevin. And you know, when, when Paige and I were moving from Cedar Rapids, Iowa to Twin Cities 15 years ago, we were expecting our fourth child at the time. And it was our sixth relocation across the country. And we had a desire to get settled as quickly as we could. And so um, we went through that process with our home finding. And we really tried to, to discipline ourselves to what are those three, four, or five things? Maybe it was around price or number of bedrooms or commute distance, whatever it was. Um, and we had to accept that there were other things that we would have wanted. But, the, but trying to find all of those things would have meant that our house hunting maybe would have taken a year and we would have lived in temporary living for a while. And so we really held tight to those things. And we house hunted one day, we looked at 20 homes, we bought a home at the end of that day. And we went back to Cedar Rapids and two weeks later we were located to the Twin Cities. Now, the home that we bought, we were 85% happy with. And we could have probably taken more time, as I mentioned, to get closer to 95 or 100%. But we were, we were okay with that compromise. And I think we can apply that same thinking to the job search process. What are those three to five things that you do not want to compromise on? And in the job search process, maybe that's the mission, vision, and values of the, of the organization or the industry that the is in. Maybe it's profit versus nonprofit. Maybe it's um, the location of the job. Maybe it's the pay. You know, the, these things are going to be different for each of us, but the key is to know what are those things for you. And then that really leads to my second point. That those things that are the gotta haves really establish what you would view as your tier one opportunities. Most people step into their job search and as you would expect, they're looking for tier one. They want to get the very best opportunity for them. Um, however, what happens is that it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it does, thankfully, and it all comes together just right, but sometimes it takes longer. And then three months kind of moves into six months, and that goes into nine months or maybe even longer. Mm -hmm. And so I really encourage people to be clear about not just defining tier one, but then define those characteristics of what a tier two opportunity would look like and a tier three, and to pursue all three tiers from the very beginning. Mm. See, because you can always say no to an offer when it comes in. And I think sometimes we're such high responsibility, high accountability people. We don't want to think that way, but, but it's okay to think that way. And that opportunity may come in and you may say no, or you may be surprised that something that you thought was a tier two or tier three, once you learn more about the opportunity, actually ranks higher than what you thought. Mm. And that's so important because it's going to help to manage your 
financial situation, maybe even your benefits during this time. Um, and, and once again, it, it's important to start broader because you can't say no to an offer that never comes in. Mm -hmm. but you can't say yes to one that never makes it in. And so I encourage people to think more broadly. So be clear about what it is that are got to have versus want to have and start more broadly with your net, cast it more broadly, and be clear as to what's the best opportunity. Go with confidence and say yes when it comes. Yeah, that's a good word. I think that that idea you had shared that with me, the tiering of, of roles mm -hmm. is, is so practical. I think uh, just in my experience, I remember when I was navigating that that job loss and looking for some new opportunity, it, there was this wrestling in me of like, hey, I'm newly married and there's a lot of urgency to finding a job and just getting into something. But you're right, there is a level of, here's my wants, here's my needs. Um, and then what are my what are my tier ones and tier twos? That's a, it's a yeah. really good word. We do have a couple questions, Scott. So oh, sure. I, wanna, I wanna jump to those questions. Um, and this is a little bit more practical and it's actually right where we're going. So it fits in perfectly. Um, somebody asked any tips for networking a new job or career? So we were going to talk about networking. So maybe you could hop in and talk about networking a little bit. What have you? What have? What best practices have you um, experienced? What could? What words could you give to help some of our uh, attenders? Yeah, exactly. Well, the first thing I would just say is that uh, networking is something that requires attention uh, all the time, not just the times that uh, that you're experiencing job loss, and yet it's such a hard time to. It's hard to find time to, to dedicate as much as we want. And if we think about those people in our lives that are some of the best networkers, um, it seems like it comes so natural for them. And I think one of the reasons is because, um, you know, they are other centered in that way. And, and it's not just about them, but it's about what they can do to help and support uh, the other person. So mm -hmm. anyway, just encourage everybody to be thinking about how can they keep building that work all the time, not just when you're but if we find ourselves in a situation right now where you really need that, um, I would really start with tools like LinkedIn. Uh, if you don't have a LinkedIn account, uh, now would be a great time to, to build one. Um, the biggest mistake that people make with a LinkedIn account is they don't uh, have a professional photo that's available. And so make sure you've got a photo that is reflective of the type of job you're looking for and your experiences. Um, and then just begin to brainstorm very broadly. Uh, who are the people uh, that you know that maybe are former coworkers of yours that are working other places now, that maybe people that um, are extended family members or maybe neighbors or maybe people you know through Westwood? And, and just, you know, be, be very open and forward in terms of inviting people to join your network through LinkedIn. Um, the key is you start to invite people through LinkedIn then is that that'll start to form this kind of this, this first group, um, this first circle around you. And then as you build confidence with that first circle, hopefully they will then in turn invite you to other people that are in their network. And then you can begin to take that first ring and get to the second, third, fourth, fifth. Uh, you know, there's some people that are so good at this, they're on their sixth or their uh, seventh ring already. Mm. And think about things that are maybe atypical. So, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, for example, you're, you're a college institution. Um, uh, when I was working at General Mills, we had 38,000 global employees, and yet I was the only Illinois Wesleyan University graduate in the entire company. Hmm. And, you know, as you can imagine, as, as the person leading recruiting, how many thousands of emails or phone calls would come in every week from people that were interested in job opportunities? Do you think that if somebody from Illinois Wesleyan had reached out that I would have prioritized that call back to a student or a graduate? Of course I would have. And so that's another way to think about as you're expanding your network is look for people that have something in common with you. Maybe it's a community um, board that you've been on. Maybe it's through the school system or just think as broadly as you can because as other people can see themselves in your story, they're gonna be more likely to personally respond to your note maybe even give you some time so you can begin to know them. And then as you build their confidence, hopefully they'll introduce you to other people. And so thinking about that more broadly, and it also leads me to my next point, and that's that as you begin to do this, it's going to begin, the multiplication of this is going to begin to explode on you. So mm -hmm. um, having some type of a tracking mechanism, a spreadsheet, really important. You may not think you need it today, 
Um, but when you have your first couple lines and those grow to 50 lines on your spreadsheet and then 100 to 150, having something that clearly identifies with an organization who your primary contact is, maybe doing a LinkedIn search to see who else in my network has worked or works there currently. So if you get invited to come in for an interview, you're not embarrassed in the lobby if somebody walks up and says, Scott, I haven't seen you in 10 years. Remember, you used to be my HR director and, and you can't even remember their name. If you had done your research, you would have known there's a chance, maybe unlikely, but there's a chance you could bump into them in the lobby. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't throw you off your game and your focus for the job that you're interviewing for that day. And so have that spreadsheet, include in there a comment section that you can put dates in. I applied for the job on this date. I'm interviewing on this date last heard from somebody on this date. And once again, that'll just help you to know what's the right cadence as to when to follow up so that not too much time goes by where you can elevate your name to the top of their inbox. But also if they tell you they're not gonna be able to get back to you until the 25th of this month, then you know that, well, let them be until the 25th. So you also don't become negative, negative focus on your cadence mm -hmm. process. And that spreadsheet can help with that. Yeah, that's super helpful. And we had talked about, um, and you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but that networking is is also an opportunity for us as uh, maybe Christ followers to to live out this practice of, of blessed to be a blessing, that, that our opportunity to network is also an opportunity for us to bless someone else. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to, Kevin. Thanks for asking about that, by the way, because um, it's something that um, I think many times we experience in the process, and this is an uncomfortable process, let's just acknowledge that, but um, most of us are not comfortable having focus on ourselves, making us the primary topic in a conversation. Um, and so there's something about that that feels very irregular. And, and yet you're out and you know that now's the time that you have to have focus on yourself. This is a time that you do need to promote your abilities uh, because uh, there's, there's a certain amount of salesmanship in this whole thing. However, while you're out making these networking connections, you may be surprised and even delighted what God has in store for you. I was uh, on one not, not too long ago, and I was having coffee where I was getting advice from somebody. And it turned out that um, they had some excellent advice for me. But then as I started to listen to what was on their mind, they were faced with a pretty significant challenge. And... Uh, to my surprise, I actually had a solution for it. It was somebody else that I'd recently met in my network. And I, I said, well, would this be helpful? And as I suggested that potential solution, it turned out it was exactly what that mm. person needed. And so I connected those two individuals in the afternoon and I walked away from that um, just with that, that inner smile, this feeling like, you know what, today wasn't about me. And that really felt good that it was really about being a blessing for somebody else. And I think those are the moments, especially at times where we maybe need it the most, where God just gives us that little reminder that I'm right there with you, I'm right by your side. Mm -hmm. And that day to me was a reminder of that. It's very encouraging to me. Yeah. So look for those moments in the process too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I want to keep us moving here. We have another question and it's right in line with where we're going again. It says, what are some of the best resources for resume writing? And we've touched on this LinkedIn profile cleanup. So you wanted to talk a little bit about resume creation and maybe updating your resume. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, the, the resume, it, it's such an interesting thing. It's a, it's a personal reflection of each of us as individuals. Um, and it's the document that gets a chance to tell our story, at least our, our work story, our work and our career experiences along the way. So I think it is important to seek advice and to get input. Um, you know, just make sure that somebody else can catch the typo or can, you know, give their reflections or ideas. But at the end of the day, I think that we also, knowing that this is a personal reflection of us, we want it to be ours in the end. We want to make a final decision as to how we're representing ourselves. I like to say that the resume, uh, its purpose is to get you the interview. And then the interview is what gets you the job. So you want to say enough on your resume that um, it, it, excite, it excites the person that's trying to learn about you and entices them to want to learn more, but you don't have to give them everything. That's what that interview is for. And so thinking about what's the proper length is important, you know, making sure that um, 
for most of us now, we're at a stage in our careers where two pages is probably more appropriate, maybe a third page. Another thing that's happening right now that's very contemporary is that people are creating snapshots. And a snapshot is really more of a one page um, introduction uh, to yourself. It may even include a photo of yourself. And the difference between a snapshot and a resume is that a snapshot is really more focused on what uh, your expertise, where that lies, and what your successes have been. And it could be that introductory, introductory document that you then share with somebody that leads to the networking coffee, that then leads to the, the uh, you know, chance to share your resume, that then leads to the interview, that leads to the job. Um, there are some sources um, out on the internet right now that can provide uh, free resume critiques for you. I think there's some pros and cons with those. Uh, the, the pro is that you can submit your resume electronically and usually within 24 to 48 hours, you'll get feedback uh, on that, which will give you some new ways to, to think about maybe uh, representing that information. Um, one of the things that um, some uh, maybe haven't been through yet is having your resume go through an applicant tracking system. And in today's world, there's probably a computer's reading your resume first, not a human being. And mm -hmm. so they can put that through the applicant tracking system, um, these free resume critiques to give you an idea of what spits out on the other end in terms of the words that you're using. And then how does that represent you in the search against the job criteria for that position? Now, the other side of it is that, um, um, you know, even though the critique is free, many times there's something that is on the other end of that, and that's that they want to rewrite your resume could be $150, it could be $250, it could be $500. I was working with somebody a couple of weeks ago and they had put the resume through that process and it kind of intrigued me. So I thought I'd put my resume through it. And mm -hmm. I got the results back in 24 hours. And believe it or not, 85% of the words were exactly the same in both of our reports. Even though he was an accountant and I was an HR guy. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it told me that there was 15% value in but it made comments that were kind of designed to alarm me. It said, we can tell that a professional hasn't done your resume. You know, like here, it was my resume, you know? <laughs> and, and, and somebody helped me with it who actually has more HR experience than I do. So, you know, here, 65 years of HR experience wasn't apparently enough to get, you know, get farther along. So, you know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with spending money on somebody to rewrite your resume or to, to um, you know, evaluate and up update your LinkedIn page for you. I think that could be a money well spent, but you could also look to somebody in your network that maybe has expertise. They could maybe do that. And, you know, this is a time right now where we're all trying to come together and support each other. You may be able to find somebody who can do that in a way that you don't have to spend maybe some of that money that's, that, you know, that, that's in, in high demand right now because of the financial situation that you're in. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't even know that there were websites that you could submit your, your resume to. So I even I learned something on this webinar. <laughs> There's I, a business model for everything, Kevin. Yeah, I think, I, out I, there. Absolutely. I remember when I first graduated uh, from college and I they always told us we had to have a one page resume. And so as I kind of walked through my first job and then ended up losing that job, I went to go I had gained a little bit of experience and it stopped fitting on one page. And I was like, I have to get this on one page. So thanks for helping me out and letting me know that you can have multiple pages on your resume. Yeah, exactly. Well, I appreciate that. So we'll keep it moving here. We wanted, I have a question about uh, interview prep and yes. getting, you know, how do you begin the process? So you've, you've kind of done the networking, maybe you've had the opportunity to submit a resume and you get called into an interview. What is that process? What is, how do you prepare for that? What does that look like? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the, I, I'm going to uh, reference another tool that's out there that may or may not be familiar to, to folks that are on the webinar tonight. And it's a site called Glassdoor. I really like Glassdoor because it's a completely independent site. And organizations will have a page there. You can go out to that Glassdoor site and you can actually see confidential um, uh, evaluations from people who have already interviewed with that organization. So you can see a rating on how difficult the interview process is. They actually will post uh, some of the interview questions that they received when they were in interviewing. And you know whether you get that exact same question or not, it would be something to help you in your preparation process 
It'll give you some insight into the culture of that organization as well and what did it feel like from a candidate experience perspective. So check out the Glassdoor site uh, along the way. The whole idea of preparation though is so important. You wanna be, you wanna make the best of that opportunity. And one of the best ways to do that uh, besides prayerful consideration is to be prepared and do your homework so that you're not asking questions that could easily be found on their careers website could easily be found in recent news articles, uh, things like that. Um, so I think being prepared and, and being prepared could include even asking somebody that's in your network if they'd be willing to do a mock interview for you. Mm. They don't have to be a professional interviewer to do that. It's just the idea of being in dialogue so that even for yourself, you can hear yourself speak, maybe even record it so you can watch yourself. You'll probably be able to make some adjustments just by going through that process alone. And the person on the other end will probably have some comments that will help to sharpen your skills along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I'd say about that, Kevin, is right now, of course, with this COVID-19 world, we're in, there's not a lot of face-to-face -face interviewing. Mm -hmm. And so we're all learning these new skills about how to show up on uh, video, you know, whether it's Zoom or whether it's Skype or Microsoft Teams or whatever that may be. And um, uh, if you go out, um, there's some really good short three to five minute videos that, that talk about how to best present yourself in a video scenario. And, you know, it talks about things like the environment. Some of these things may seem obvious, but I remember an author, Patrick Lentz and Lenny Lynch said that adult learners need to be reminded more than they need to be instructed. Mm. And so just the reminders on the environment to make sure you're thinking about noise, and being able to control that during that time period. You even put a sign outside your front door you know, so that if UPS comes by, they don't ring the doorbell because you say you're, you're on an active video interview. Uh, it may include things like looking at lighting um, and to ensure that you've got the right angle. Um, they, one, of the, one of the tips that they talk about is to ensure that you have your camera. Not only are you looking into your camera as you're going through the interview process, but to have that camera at eye level, just like you would in a normal conversation. So that may mean you need to lift up you know, your laptop with some books or a box or something like that. That's not gonna be seen on the video, but it's gonna make it more appealing as you have that interaction. And then maybe even go as far as think about what you're wearing. Mm -hmm. There's something that I think it's usually recommended to have solid plain colors on if you can, um, to try to stay as still as you can as you're talking and not move around too much so that the, it doesn't create a distraction uh, for the person on the other end. And, and once again, this is all designed so that the focus can be on what you're saying, not necessarily how you're saying or how you're showing up. on Yeah. Well, it's got to have to be honest. You're, you're talking and I'm like, I start to evaluate all of the things. I have my, my dog beeper so that the dog starts bark, barking. I can give him a little beep so he doesn't do that. And I'm like, oh man, I'm in red. That's not a plain color. So I'm starting to evaluate all of those things as we're on this call together. But I do think it's true. One of the things that even we've experienced as a church is we didn't meet digitally. And so now we're thrust into this new world. And so for many of us, it's a learning experience. But I would encourage people, once you kind of get the hang of it, it becomes more natural. So get on, get familiar, um, use FaceTime, use Zoom, use um, Microsoft Teams or Skype, whatever you have available to you to get familiar with these platforms. Um, there's lots of tutorials on YouTube to, to learn and um, there's lots of great resources there. So I'd encourage you to do that. We have a couple questions that I wanna make sure that I get to. Um, one question is around gratitude and the process of, you know, decreasing our stress or our concern are there any have you ever practiced gratitude in that transition period maybe for you um, it's right now could you share a little bit about how gratitude maybe plays into this process of, of job transition yeah a couple of things that kind of come to mind is um, sometimes that gratitude is something that you reflect on when you get through the other side of the tunnel you know, mm -hmm. once the opportunity comes and uh, you can relax a little bit more and you know you realize that this really has reshaped my life this has created an opportunity that i maybe wouldn't have dreamed of on my own i maybe wouldn't have had the courage to do it and this was um, just enough um, to to move you forward because maybe in your heart you knew that things weren't quite right in that job but you weren't ready to make the change and here that decision was made for you mm -hmm. so sometimes that gratitude comes through a 
of uh, reflection when we get to the other side. I do think it's important to, to think about gratitude through the process as well. I think it's really important that you express gratitude to those that are willing to help you. Mm. Um, you know, they, people are going to have all kinds of comments and thoughts and, and we're, you know, it's just very human to just worry about the judgments that maybe people have or what they're saying and, and trying to push as many of those things aside, stay positive and express sincere gratitude. Even if you feel like the help is coming um, in a way that is, um, that is less than sincere, if it's help, accept it and be thankful for it. And for those people that, that just surprise you with the things that they're doing, be willing to accept that help and then honor them in a way by keeping them up to date with what's going on. Mm. So if somebody's going to invest time in you to review your resume or to tell you about an organization or to make a contact, uh, the least we can do is keep them in touch with what's going on. Yeah. I know it's been a few weeks, but I wanted to update you, Kevin. You referred me to X organization, and I want to let you know it didn't work out, unfortunately. And that must not be what God's plan is for my life. So mm. I just want to thank you again. If there's ever a time that I can return that favor, please let me know. Mm. Or Hey, I'm going in to interview, you know, uh, in a week. And I'm so excited about that. And at the same point, don't know how it's going to turn out. And th those things take time. And so um, I don't think that there's always an expectation of the person that is providing um, that help that, that that's gonna, they're going to be treated that way. But I think it's a very respectful way to show gratitude back to them. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's really good. A couple other questions. Um, with so many companies not hiring right now due to kind of the hiring freeze, how do you find a role that will help you grow um, your career with most companies kind of um, not hiring for your previous role? So I think where this person is coming from is, okay, um, my previous role, maybe they're not hiring for that type of role. How could I advance my career with maybe not the same uh, exact role? Any, any words for that person? You know, it'd be helpful to know even more specifics about what that type of work that they're doing and those kinds of things. I think that there are some functions right now that going through a time like this, it's a reminder of those organizations that they maybe need to invest more in that because they're not getting what they need to manage through or lead through the crisis that they're in right now. And so mm -hmm. uh, it's possible that some organizations actually are going to be have a new focus on hiring for those roles because of the circumstances we're in right now. That's not necessarily true for all functions though. And there's a lot of articles that are available right now that kind of lay out, um, you know, some words that can feel uncomfortable when, when jobs and job categories are defined as essential and non-essential. Mm -hmm. I would encourage people to look at the industries that are really benefiting right now. And so if you're a place like Amazon right now, you probably can't hire enough people what's going on. So looking at those businesses or those industries that are uniquely challenged right now, um, they may be a softer landing spot and uh, you may find that that was an industry you hadn't considered before, but all of a sudden there's new learnings in there because you're learning and you're going up a learning curve that you didn't have before. And so I would focus on industries and then organizations within those industries. And uh, once again, you know, I would, I would utilize that network uh, because you're going to have your own ideas about maybe where you could go, but your network's going to expand your thinking on that as you, as you activate with that. That's good. One last question that we have is, um, it says, I'm 63, too old um, to looking for, I'm 63, is 63 too old, excuse me, is 63 too old to look for a, a career job? Will employers stay away from me? <laughs> what do you think about that, Scott? Well, I would, I mean, I would say no, but you know, there's, there's, if we're, we're speaking candidly tonight with each other uh, in the context of faith and our connection at Westwood. I think that um, there's a reality to those things. I'm 52 years old and um, you know, I, I, I'm sure that there's been some individuals that maybe have looked at my profile or looked at the things that I've done and, you know, they're maybe not going to say Scott's too old to do that job, but, um, you know, they may in their mind question things like how long is his runway? Mm. Uh, is he, you know, and it comes out in strange ways. You, uh, Scott, we love you, but you're overqualified or, 
Um, and so, you know, some of those things, you know, we can maybe try to influence by saying things like, I'm really looking for this next opportunity uh, as I evaluate my horizon for the next 10 to 15 years. Or you can say things that help them to realize that maybe you're not going to come in and one or two years later done. But there's some things that we can't control. And I think that's where we have to just lean back on our faith and know that, um, that whatever is next is in God's hands. In a sense, he's probably already set the table for us. We just haven't had a chance to sit down to it yet. Um, but I would say that, you know, think more in terms of age as a state of mind. I would say, you know, um, conscious about um, how you show up in that way. But, you know, I'd also say, let's not worry about things that we can't control. And in mm -hmm. the end, we really want to find the best fit. And so even though uh, in, if an employer is evaluating that way and we know that that is, um, you know, um, against employment law, you know, currently, um, you know, we may also be saying to ourselves, you know what, that's not going to be the right fit. If they're using that type of a judgment, that may not be the only way that they're thinking about living out their values and conducting themselves in a culture. And so, you know, that's probably not the right place uh, for us anyway. If we're mm -hmm. faced with those things. So it doesn't make it right, but it may mean that that wasn't the right opportunity in the first place. And so I'd say at 63, well, there's still a lot of life ahead. And mm -hmm. so go for it. And um, could be a, it could be a moment of new awakening to apply all the experiences you've had up to this point, not just in terms of doing your job, but being an inspiration and a mentor to others to bring them along and share that knowledge with them along. Yeah, uh, that's such a that's so encouraging because I think that there's there are pro there are organizations that value experience, that maybe have a younger workforce that would actually love the experience of someone who's been in the industry for a long time, and can help educate and and bring some other leaders along or or employees along. So I think that that's a really good word. It's all about values. Yeah, and Kevin, can I add one other thought to that? There are some organizations that are uniquely set up for the experienced leader. Yeah. I'm thinking of organizations like Patina Solutions and places like this, and they specialize in people that have 30 or more years of experience in the workplace. And so, so organizations come to places like Patina, and you can sign up to be a part of the Patina Nation, and that Patina Nation could be a short-term contract role. It could be a contract like temp to perm opportunity, or it could be a permanent hire opportunity. But employers know that there's places like that when they're coming because they want somebody who has more, not less experience. And mm -hmm. so I think sometimes we can look at those challenges and we can turn those around and use those to our advantage. Mm -hmm. I maybe never would have thought to work for Amazon before, but they need people like no other right now. I'm going to consider Amazon and maybe having my next career stage there. Wow. I'm going to maybe consider going to a place like that because they have clients who are looking for people just like me. And so why not go with the grain? Yeah. See that's where awesome. it could go. Yeah. Super cool. Well, that's all our questions that, that people had for you. Um, and, uh, and so anything else you want to cover tonight? Do we have time that I could ask you a question? Kevin? We do have a few minutes. You can ask me a question. Because I think a good interview. In any good interview, there's usually time that the candidate has a chance to turn the table and, uh, mm -hmm. I would just love to get your insight, you know, as one of our uh, pastors at Westwood, and just as you think about what is the right balance between the, the, the work that we need to do as we invest in that next career opportunity and, and seeking out our network and doing our resume and preparing for the interview, how do you balance that with just trusting in God for that plan that he already has in place for us? And, and where, where's the line between those things and any insider advice that could be encouraging for those of us that are in those situations right now? Yeah, I think that's a great, I think that's a great question because so many of us kind of, you know, how much is too much? How much um, am I, am I leaning on my own strength? And this has been true for me in a lot of experiences in my life of like, am I too reliant on my own skills, my own strength? And the balance that I've always had uh, for me personally is, um, to make sure that I'm praying over the things that I'm doing. So as I'm before, maybe I'm going into an interview or uh, as I'm writing my resume, as I'm uh, reaching out to someone to network, am I taking the time to just pray over those things, to bring it before God 
Um, as Christ followers, we believe that God is in the midst of all of it. And even the hard stuff God can work through uh, to help us develop into who he wants us to become. And I think he works in our putting one foot in front of the other. And I think the challenge of that is, are we doing that out of our own strength or are we giving that up to God? There's a, um, a, a picture that I have of, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat of a control freak. I like to be in control. And so uh, for many of you, if you're facing a job transition or uh, maybe you know somebody who is, the challenge of it is you've lost control. You, you don't have control over the job opportunity, the next opportunity that you're going to get. Um, but what God is inviting us into is to control what we control, lead where we can lead, and then where we can't, surrender it up to him. And we do that most frequently in our lives through prayer. Um, and so my encouragement to anyone who's experiencing that, maybe they feel out of control. They want, they're kind of grasping at the steering wheel again and want to hold on tight. Um, surrender that to God, open your hands up and, and practice prayer and just lifting those things up to God on a regular basis and praying over those those networking meetings and that resume and, and the practice interviews and the LinkedIn profile and all of those things that may feel silly praying about, but I do think that God works in and through all of those things to make a difference in our lives. Um, and that, that would be my encouragement. And it's it's, it was helpful for me as I experienced my job transition. So I hope and pray that it's helpful for those who are listening that are experiencing the same. Good, thank you. Well, Scott, thank you so much for being on. We're one minute over. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful for you being on um, this webinar with us. Oh, thank you, Kevin. This has been great. And I just, you know, I, I just uh, want to encourage everybody that is tuning in tonight that especially for those of you that are finding yourself in that situation right now and facing uncertainty at this point. And I just want to give you the hope and the encouragement that um, you're going to get to the other side of this. And when you do, the experience that you're going through right now uh, is going to refine you and it's going to give you some insight. It's going to make you a stronger person and even a stronger coworker in the future as we support other people that maybe go through some other things uh, down, the, down the line. The things we talked about tonight, they're not necessarily right or wrong. And so there's a lot of gray area here. And so um, the things that I shared tonight was just one person's opinion. Uh, it's certainly informed by 30 years of human resources experience. But uh, my hope is that there's at least one thing that each of you can pull away uh, that you can apply right away to make a difference in whatever you're faced with tonight. So thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, I do want to close in prayer, but before we do that, I have a couple of invitations that I want to give you. This uh, interview, this webinar will be recorded and posted on YouTube uh, tomorrow, hopefully. And so if you have family members or friends or people in your network, that could be, uh, this could be a resource for them. Feel free to share it, give it away. Um, we really want this to uh, reach as many people as we can. So be sure to do that. And then also want to let you know that there are two more webinars coming. I shared this at the beginning, but tomorrow we're talking about through parenting, through COVID. So if you are a parent, maybe you know somebody, maybe you have a family member who would benefit from that, share the webinar link. We'd love for them to be a part of that. And then on Thursday at 8 p.m., uh, Joel Johnson is joining Jill Fox and myself to talk about finding God in the middle of COVID-19 and what that looks like. So if you are have friends or family members, coworkers maybe that are navigating kind of where is God in the midst of all this, invite them to the webinar. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. Um, and we're going to we're going to grow together. So we'd love to see you on those webinars. But before we go, I do want to close in prayer. So if you guys would pray with me, I would pray for you and those who are experiencing job loss. So will you guys pray with me? Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your goodness and your grace, even in the midst of hard seasons. God, I lift up all of those who are experiencing job loss or job transition in this season. God, I pray that you would bring peace that you would bring comfort, that you would bring um, wisdom to each and every one of them. God, I pray that you would um, use this time to help them grow closer to you, that you would draw them to yourself even, even in this season and help use this to be uh, a tool to help them grow to be more like your son, Jesus. God, we uh, desperately need you for so many things in this season. And so uh, we look to you. We ask for your peace and your power and your presence to be known in and through our lives. God, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah. All right, friends. Well, thanks for joining us. We'll uh, we'll see you tomorrow night and Thursday night too. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Thank you. Have a great night.